Reading with your kids. Hola, Niha, Kunichiwa, Assalamu alaikum, Shalom, Mahaba, Muni Muli Wanji, Namaste, Jambo, Bienvenidos. Hi, my name is Jadley, and this is the Reading with Your Kids podcast, an iHeartRadio Best Kids and Family Podcast Award nominee. We're coming to you from the beautiful neighborhood of Reedville in the southwest corner of Boston, Massachusetts. We're so delighted and honored that you're joining us in our mission to help families grow closer through reading. Please be sure to subscribe to the show in the iHeartRadio app. On Amazon Music, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher Radio, wherever you find your podcast. Our guest today is Ruth Spiro. She'll be here to celebrate Maxine and the greatest garden ever. Before we invite Ruth in to join us, we want to invite you to join us at our website, readingwithyourkids.com. When you go there, you can sign up for our free newsletter. Find out what's coming up next on the podcast. Find out what you might have missed. And also discover some great recipes you can create with your kids, games you can play with your kids, and and discover ways you can protect the planet with your kids. That's right. You can also find out about a great new special series of episodes, Protecting the Planet with Your Kids. You can find it all at readingwithyourkids.com. Joining us right now from Chicago in the state of Illinois, she is the author of a fantastic new book called Maxine and the Greatest Garden Ever. Please welcome to the show, Ruth Spiro. Ruth, how are you? I am well, thank you. How are you? I'm wonderful. I am so excited that you are here. I love the title uh, being a, a, a circus guy, I just love being able to get up and say, the greatest garden ever. <laughs> I'm imagining reading this book with my kids and probably driving my beautiful wife crazy because I'd be shouting that. <laughs> I can imagine you would be shouting that, yes. <laughs> Tell us all about Maxine and what makes her garden greater than all the others. So actually, this is the second book. Um, in my Maxine series. The first book was called Made by Maxine, and it's about a girl who likes to make things, but not necessarily in a crafty sense. She uh, deconstructs and reconstructs and tinkers and tweaks and hacks, and she's more of a maker. Um, and in the first book, she creates a contraption that will allow her beloved pet goldfish Milton to march in the class pet parade. Because, you know, a goldfish can't march because he doesn't have feet. So, you know, and friends have said, well, why didn't she just put the goldfish bowl in a wagon? And I said, that's because Maxine doesn't do things that way. (laughs) She creates contraptions like a pedal-powered fish feeder and things like that. So anyway, she solves her problem in Made by Maxine. And Milton does indeed get to participate in the class pet parade. And so the second adventure is... Um, we introduce a friend, one of Maxine's friends, his name is Leo, and they like to, they both like to make things, but in very different ways. And Leo is a little more artsy. He likes to sew and he likes to uh, create uh, more artistic things. And Maxine is very goal oriented and she likes to make things, but um, more in a practical way you know, get it done kind of way. And so they make a, they find some seeds while cleaning out the garage and they decide to create a garden together. And they do it in a very spectacular way because just putting seeds in the ground is not either one of their styles at all. Very, very cool. <laughs> I, I, I love that. I love that. What a neat character Maxine is is she inspired by anybody in particular well there's actually an interesting story behind that so um, I used to be a freelance writer and I uh, wrote for Family Fun magazine and at one point I was writing an article about um, how families could incorporate STEM into the home with activities and toys and books and games and I did a ton of research this was quite a while ago And at one point I just, I learned about the maker movement and I just, I kind of went down the rabbit hole and became so interested in learning about um, makers and and why people were doing these. And this is before 
there were maker spaces in libraries and classrooms and all that. This is when people were like working in garages and, um, <clears throat> you know, um, uh, like, oh, uh, anyway, they, it, it, people were working in, in their basement, you mm-hmm. know, making things. There were no 3D printers really at that time. But anyway, I was learning all about makers and what, what, what drove them to, uh, create things and make things and take things apart and put them back together and all that. And I, I was just so fascinated by what these folks were doing. I just thought, you know what? I, there needs to be a children's book written about a character who embodies these qualities. Yeah, that's a, uh, a, a really, uh, a movement that has a lot of momentum behind it right now. It certainly does. And, and parents and educators are really, um, they're waking up to all of the benefits that making, in quotes, has for children in, in developmentally. Um, you know, it, it develops a, it helps to, to develop, uh, persistence and perseverance and what they like to call a growth mindset, which is um, becoming aware of what you can do and what you can't do and learning how to do things. Um, So it really, it's a great example for kids because we know that a lot of times kids will try something and if it doesn't work out, they get very frustrated and sometimes they just, they walk away from their project. And that's not how life works. That's not how science works. That's not how engineering works. Um, and so it's really setting a great example for them, showing that, um, you know, it's that failure isn't necessarily the end of the road. It's just a, an opportunity to pivot and to learn something new and to try something else. And Maxine, her motto is, if I can dream it, I can build it. And at one point, you know, she she continually fails and she says, well, I've already discovered a million ways that won't work, which means I'm getting closer to finding a way that will. And that's really the the most important message that I um, want kids to take away from my books is that um, just because something doesn't work out the first time, that's great. You just take that information that you learned from that and you use it to try something else. That really is important. And, uh, you know, I was involved with uh, Jennifer Swanson and the Solve for Kids podcast. We had a chance to interview astronauts, nuclear physicists, engineers, aquanauts, all these incredibly talented uh, makers, but, but on a grand scale. And each and every one of them talked about their failures and the fact that their failures were steps towards success. And there, there, there are kids who give up really easily. And there are parents who don't want their kids to feel any kind of disappointment. So they bubble wrap their kids and they shield them from disappointment and failure. And I think that's a, I, I know it's coming from a place of love, but I think it's a huge disservice to our kids. Our kids need to fail. They need to fail when they're trying to build something sciencey. They need to fail when they're when they're trying to learn a sport. When they're learning to dance, it's all part of the growth process. Exactly, exactly. And um, while it's difficult to experience that failure personally. Sometimes it makes it easier to handle when you can experience that through a character that's in a book that you're reading. Mm -hmm. So you're not personally experiencing it, but you're watching the character experience it. And you're seeing what they do and, and hopefully modeling that behavior and saying, oh, wait a minute. You know, I read that story about that girl and she failed a million times, but... In the end, she was able to accomplish her goal. So, you know, these are all uh, examples that make it a little easier for kids to swallow um, when they have seen a, a beloved character experience a, a failure and, and come out on the other side yeah. in, in, ahead. You know, as you're speaking, uh, Ruth, I believe that that is a great lesson that kids can take from reading Maxine and The Greatest Garden <laughs> Ever. I think that parents should absolutely read this book with their kids because I think a lot of the parents, they need to learn that, that lesson too. Maybe more than their kids need to learn. So it'd be really, <laughs> I think it'd be really, uh, 
helpful for them to see Maxine and the fact that Maxine survived and actually grew from the experience. Exactly. Exactly. And that, you know, failing a million times, you know, she didn't say, okay, never mind. I'm not going to do this anymore. It's too frustrating. She said, okay, wait. So I, I learned what doesn't work and that's information for me. That's data. And then I can use that data to try something else to, you know, eliminate the options that don't work. Um, and it does, it, it just makes it easier when you can live through that failure, um, while reading about a character instead of, um, experiencing it yourself. I mean, obviously, you know, all kids and adults, we're going to experience failure, but the more, uh, examples we have, um, of characters who get through that, uh, it, it makes it a little easier for us to say, okay, well, maybe I can do that too. Yeah. Now, you've made a career out of taking some really <laughs> difficult concepts and making them accessible to kids, very young kids. You have a baby love series, and I'm looking on your website, and you have Baby Loves Gravity, Baby Loves Thermodynamics, Baby Loves Quantum Physics. I don't understand quantum physics. How can you write a book f that makes quantum physics understandable for babies? So <clears throat> it's interesting that you picked that particular title. So most of the books are on hard science. So, for example, gravity or th thermodynamics, which is about the transfer of energy, or um, uh, structural engineering, which is about uh uh, force and, and load and, and mass. So um, what I'm doing actually, so the first book in that series that came out was um, Baby Loves Aerospace Engineering. And all of the books start with a real world example of something that would be familiar to a small child. So in Aerospace Engineering, I start with um, watching a bird fly. Ah. And how does the bird fly? It has wings. And the wings, um, the, the bird is able to fly because of the airflow, because of the shape of the bird's wings. The top of the wing is curved and the bottom of the wing is flat. And then I go into, you know, does an airplane flap its wings? No, it has engines. So <clears throat> I start with something very simple. Gravity, we start with what do children do when they're sitting in a high chair and they've got the Cheerios, they're dropping them to watch them fall, right? They love to watch drop things and watch them fall. Well, that's gravity. And when you go down the slide at the park, that's also gravity. So I'm taking things that um, children are going to be familiar with and that they're going to see all around them and explaining what the science is behind it. And I've done a, t a lot of research into child development to make sure that I'm doing this in a way that is developmentally appropriate, but that's also going to be fun and informative and entertaining because we want to be reading books to our kids that they love and that they enjoy and that engage them. You know, we don't want to be trying to teach a toddler about force and motion and, you know, things that things that wouldn't be really be interested, interesting to them or developmentally appropriate. But we say, hey, when we go down the slide at the park, that's gravity that's helping us down. Well, that makes sense. And that's what teachers like to call scaffolding, where you take something that's a concept that they understand, and then you're building on that. So getting back to quantum physics, that is something that like a lot of adults, including me, have a really hard time even grasping too. However, there's a very famous thought experiment about putting a cat in a box. And in my story, rather than the cat being uh, alive or not alive, mm -hmm. um, the cat is either asleep or awake. So baby is playing hide and seek with the cat, and the cat goes into a box. And if the cat is inside the box, we don't know if the cat is asleep or awake until we open up the box and we take a look. And so that's sort of a play on the Schrodinger's cat thought mm -hmm. experiment. But... It's also an example of object permanence because the children that are being read this, this story to, they're right in that developmental phase of if, if something goes into the box, is it still there or did it disappear? So it's a really great example. I sort of melded those two topics together so that we're in, introducing an idea that is developmentally appropriate for children that age, 
but also it's sort of a tongue in cheek um, reference to something that's uh, a loftier and a little bit um, uh, more high level and that mm-hmm. I think a lot of parents do appreciate. So that that's sort of where that came from. Now, you were sharing with us earlier that that, that Maxine's, it, the inspiration from Maxine mm-hmm. came from the, that article that you wrote on the Makerspace movement for a magazine. Did you always see yourself writing books for kids and especially writing books to help them understand sciences and, and inspire them to, to be creative? So I actually did not. When I first started writing, um, that was not something that actually had occurred to me. Uh, and then in 2010, I read an article that was in the New York Times about how picture book sales were really way down. And that was because parents were um, there was a, 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 a steep decline in the sale of picture books because parents were thinking that picture books were too easy for their small children and they wanted to bump them up to chapter books. So they were reading, you know, Junie B. Jones and higher, they were reading Harry Potter to three year olds. And, um, you know, anyone who has studied the field will tell you that picture books are really de- important developmentally for children so they can learn how to follow the text and the illustrations because the illustrations tell a, t- a story as well. Plus, they're just, they're fun and they're cozy and they're enjoyable and we shouldn't be um, denying our children the opportunity to be enjoying picture books even as they get older. And so I was with a group of writer friends at the time and I said, what do these parents want? Quantum physics for babies? And when I first said it, it was kind of a joke. But the more I thought about it, I thought, well, would this work? And what could that look like? And that was when, so before I even did any of the research for the books, I did research into child development just to make sure that I would be able to do this in a way that would be appropriate and that would have value. I didn't want it to be a joke. I didn't want it to be, oh, ha, ha, here's a funny baby shower present. Here's quantum physics for babies. I wanted it to have some value to it. Um, And so by doing the child development research first and then the science research, I came up with a way to present the material in 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 a way that would be both informative, but also engaging and appropriate for children um, that are, you know, very, very young. Yeah. Well, it certainly sounds like you've you've hit on a great formula to go back to the the science analogy. Um, (laughs) Yeah. That's really wonderful. What is it? You know, we talk about um, authors and 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 ask them oftentimes how they feel, thinking that wow, this family is going to be sitting down and reading this this really cuddly book. And how does that make you feel, knowing that 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 family is going to be cuddling together re- reading your book? I'm wondering, how does it feel imagining that the next generation of of scientists? are being inspired by your books, by your Maxine and the Greatest Garden Ever book, and by your Baby Loves Science series? I really hope that's the case. And the funny thing is when I went into this, it, that never occurred to me. I didn't really think about that. But the more time goes by and uh, parents are posting pictures on social media of their children with my books and how much they're enjoying them and, and you know they're inspired to create contraptions and to watch the bird, watch birds fly and talk about their wings and all that. It really, um, it, 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 it helps me get through all of the difficulty of what is involved in actually researching and writing books. And, you know, when you just said that to me, it just sort of gave me a lump in my throat because, um, it really is, you know, writing is, is a very solitary endeavor and, I sit in my office and I I write and I think and I research and, you know, just then thinking about the children that are going to be reading my books, um, it, it really does kind of keep me going. And um, one thing that's interesting that really just kind of occurs to me is, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the Draw a Scientist study. So there's this ongoing study that was first done, I think, in the 1960s, and um, sort of like a social science experiment. And they asked a group of children to draw what does 99, well over 99% of the children drew the scientist as a male. 
there were a couple of drawings that were of females, um, but it was just a tiny fraction and they were drawn only by girls. And that same study has been repeated I, many, many times throughout the years. And it's gotten to the point where um, now a little, I think it's like a little over half the time um, that the scientists are drawn as female. But um, those are mostly dr- drawn by girls. Mm-hmm. The boys still draw the scientist as a male, you know, I think more than 90% of the time. So we're getting there. Um, but these kinds of gender stereotypes, um, they shape kids' perceptions of what they can do and what they can't do. And I think it's really important to have um, – these examples and role models in in books and, and movies and games and whatever for children showing, you know, that that girls can be just as successful and have interests in science and you know, STEM and all these these fields. And, um, I, you know, I hope that that all of these, not just mine, but all the books that are out, you know, the Rosie Revere's and the um, all, all these books, I, I, I hope that they are also inspiring girls to see that they can also have um, careers in these fields. And, and it's also important that boys see girls succeeding in these kinds of roles and that boys see that girls can also be scientists and engineers and jet pilots and fighter pilots and um, physicists. And um, so I hope that by, you know, putting these out there and showing examples um, that they're not just books to inspire girls, but they're books that will inspire boys as well. Absolutely. Yes. A great reminder that, that books can be mirrors, windows and sliding glass doors. And we're really yes. excited uh, that, that you've created this book. I, I've had a wonderful time getting to know Maxine and getting to know about her greatest garden and her friend and the Baby Love Science series. Uh, where can folks go to find out more about you and more about all of your great books? Well, my website is ruthspiro.com, although I've been so busy with my books, <laughs> it desperately needs an update. But I'm everywhere on social media. Um, I'm Ruth Spiro. I'm on Instagram. I'm on Twitter. Facebook. So um, you can pretty much find me anywhere and um, anywhere that books are sold, your favorite bookseller. I love to support independent bookstores, um, but whatever, wherever people like to uh, buy books, they can find information about these. There's also um, uh, book trailers for the books and activity guides as well that are on the publisher's websites. And I'll make sure that you have links to those that you can put in the show notes. Wonderful. We've had a great time speaking to the author of Maxine and the Greatest Garden Ever and also the author of the Baby Love Science series, Ruth Sparrow. Hey, Ruth, thanks so much for being part of the show. Thank you so much for having me. This was wonderful. I really appreciate it. Please be sure to join us for the next edition of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. It will be Earth Day, and we will be celebrating by launching our special limited edition series called Protecting the Planet With Your Kids. My co-host and I, Alexia Brown, will be introducing you to some fantastic authors who can tell you all about climate change. Tell us why it's important for us to talk to our kids about climate change. And most importantly, tell us how we can talk to our kids without scaring the heck out of them. It's a really, really fun series. You don't want to miss it. It all starts April 22nd, Earth Day 2021. I want to thank the folks who made today's show so wonderful. Of course, I want to thank our guest, Ruth Spiro. Be sure to check out Maxine and the greatest garden ever. I also want to thank my team, Alejandra Doherty, Fatima Khan, Hannah Pat Oboisky, Alexia Brown. I want to thank my beautiful wife for all the support she gives me. I want to thank Augie the Doggy for having my back here in the studio. Most of all, we all want to thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. And as always, thank you so very much for taking the time to make the world a better place by reading with your kids. I'll be looking for you in the next edition of 
the Reading With Your Kids podcast. 